Hello human friends and welcome to this new Q&A video. So today I'm going to answer some of your questions that you asked me uh, under the previous Q&A video and somewhere else around uh, my channel. First of all, remember that if you want me to answer your questions, you have to simply drop your own uh, questions in the comment section of this video. So that said, let's start with the first one. So the first question comes from uh, Florian, which asks me which kind of gloves uh, we should use in the arming sword practice. Now, these uh, questions have a huge number of answers <laughs> because there is not the ideal glove. I mean, there is uh, almost the ideal glove right now, which is the Pro Gauntlet, uh, is the best option in terms of mobility and protection, considering the tests that I have done it in two cases, which I had to test them. I suppose that, uh, because they are, of course, finger gloves uh, and the non not mittens one, um, are uh, ideal for, uh, generally speaking, one-handed swords, which needs more movement in your, uh, in your fingers to be used. Um, so, the Pro Gauntlets are most probably the best option we have right now for all the weapons, generally speaking. But they are also, uh, they are not cheap. Of course. So, if you are in search for something cheaper than the Pro Gauntlets, um, you have to choose. So, you have to choose between uh, protection and uh, mobility. So, if you are in search for mobility, the ideal option are still now the Red Dragon kind of gloves uh, or all similar gloves with that kind of shape. So, generally speaking, is an improved uh, lacrosse kind of glove. So that's the still the best option for one-handed weapons when you are in search for mobility. But of course, you have to sacrifice uh, protection and uh, some kind. Uh, almost every, <laughs> almost every arming sword is able to hit uh, really hard if the replica is good enough. Of course, if you have some kind of weird replica which is uh, safety oriented, it's different. But. Uh, of course, if, if you want, uh, instead of mobility, to go for uh, protection, you have to go for, like, uh, sparring gloves. I, in my opinion, the sparring gloves are the best one because they are uh, thinner than other kind of gloves, like, uh, for example, the Spes uh, gloves, which are more protective, but are huge. So you have to design your sword in relation to the glove, which is something which I Personally speaking, I don't really like. So, if you are in search for protection, you want to use an arming sword, go for the um, sparring gloves. Instead, if you are in search for mobility, pay attention, of course, and go for the Red Dragons one. So, that's my answer. So, the second question comes from uh, Martin, which asks me, uh, what is your weekly training uh, schedule these days and what do you focus on personally? So now that we are more or less uh, in lockdown, so I, as you can see, I am free by now, but it's only for seven days before we go <laughs> back into the lockdown situation. But generally speaking, when I am in lockdown, I focus on uh, um, strength training, uh, mobility training, etc., etc. So I do, I do a, a lot of uh, uh, physical training, mainly uh, free body exercises. I train footwork a lot, um, everything that I can do in uh, uh, a flat, basically. So that's, uh, that's the important thing, everything that I can do easily inside of the space that I have. Uh, that's uh, ever, uh, the, the main thing that rules the, the kind of, um, of training that I am doing. So, generally speaking, um, free body exercises, footwork training, uh, uh, everything is possible. Uh, then I do some exercises with weights and uh, I use also um, the elastic bands a lot because they are cheap, are easy. You can do uh, the exercises with them basically everywhere. And uh, yes, uh, in terms of free body exercises, I am kind in love with, um, well, calisthenics is basic, the same of free body exercise uh, in some ways. But um, to, to better explain you, I am falling in love with calisthenics these days and I am trying to progress through the different levels of um, same exercises, so making the exercise uh, harder and harder. Because, for example, I make the, uh, the easiest example possible, which is the push-up. 
you can do push-ups in, uh, I don't know, let's say 100 different ways. And uh, the standard push-up is only one of the ways. Then you can improve the push-up, which means making it harder and which also means more gains in different parts of the body. So you have the push-ups which are more about the arms, the, the other which are more about the chest. So by doing this kind of progression, we can do a lot of uh, different exercises. So you don't get bored, which is important. Um, you can do a lot of uh, a workout. You can have uh, better gains through time. The important thing is that you have to be able to uh, recognize which kind of level uh, uh, you are at the moment. So, for example, uh, if you are able to do, for example, I don't know, uh, 30 push-up in a row, you understand that you can go up and uh, change exercise, improve it, and then you change kind of push-up and you improve it. So that's uh, my, my basic training. Of course, I do also weapon handling as much as possible. And uh, yeah, as I said, in relation to the space which I have, uh, solo forms, if I can manage like now to go outside, I do solo training with the sword because I want to use the time uh, in the best way as possible. And so that's it. That's my training at the moment. So the next question comes from Dwayne Krakel, which asks me, when do you launch an attack while fighting? Example, do you watch for your opponent to shift her, his weight backwards or move their hands? So, generally speaking, the, the, the very concept of attacking is taking the initiative. So if I watch the opponent for some kind of movement, it may be, of course, a good idea sometimes, so I am searching for the right moment to land my action, but it can be also a problem because uh, if I rely too much on the movements of my opponent, I am not really taking the initiative because, of course, I am attacking, I want to be the attacker, so I want to take the initiative. It is better to provoke his movements. So, for example, if I go for a straight attack, so I want to uh, do a simple attack like a thrust or a cut, and I do it uh, but while waiting for the opponent, uh, let's say for the right moment in which he does some kind of error, so move the weight, uh, whatever, so exposing the ends, etc. Uh, it may be a good idea at the very beginning, but generally speaking, is if someone is uh, showing you some kind of motion or whatever, it may be the case that he is programming you, so he offers the hands in a way that you go for the hands. And uh, there you have to think about, should I go for the hands or should I, I don't know, for example, faint for the hands and then taking, taking the initiative uh, while he's going for the pairing or a post or whatever. So, generally speaking, waiting when you want to be the attacker is bad. So, watch the opponent, of course, uh, try to understand what he's doing, where he's positioned, where his hands are or whatever, but don't wait for some kind of movement. Try to make it happen with your own action, so with feints, beats, whatever. So uh, try to control the opponent in this way and then land your attack. Because if you wait for something, maybe it's the opponent which is programming you. So he have the initiative and not you. So. Uh, this is a general advice, but generally speaking, not always, because of course I do plenty of errors, as, as any fencer, I suppose. Generally speaking, the best idea, uh, wh when I uh, succeed, is because I am doing something which creates the occasion. So I create the occasion myself, then I land my attack. That's the best uh, thing you can do. If uh, we are talking uh, about a step before, yes, striking an attack into, um, let's say, an invitation, so the opponent show his hands, you can go for the hands, may because maybe he's doing it in a, let's say, too extreme way. So he's exposing the hands too much. You understand that you are able, because you are fast enough, you know yourself, to get the hands 
uh, in a split of second and you do it. So it depends, it really depends case by case. Sometimes you can uh, use the trap of, of the opponent, uh, the uh, um, bad made trap to hit him. Other times instead, if you fall in the trap, you being hit yourself. So if uh, you spot the trap, you have to decide. Either I accept that situation and, and I go straight because uh, I have the, let's say, speed, fitness level, whatever, uh, tactics, well, tactics, um, the, the abilities to hit uh, the, the spot in a fast way, or either I use tactics instead and then I try to steal uh, an action. So I just do my feint, the opponent parries because he wants to do it, and then I hit him in another place. This is the very basic idea. Then you can make it complex and complex. You can create a lot of plans, which involves footwork, movements around of your body or whatever. So, um, but yeah, generally speaking, Yes, sometimes I hit the opponent when he is moving um, in some kind of, uh, let's, let's say, movement that I, I see uh, in that moment and I consider it an error. And then I strike inside of the error, which is uh, a reasonable uh, option and a reasonable idea. And uh, I have success. Sometimes uh, I spot an error but uh, it wasn't an error, it was uh, the plan of my opponent to show me that error and the opponent uh, have a success. So, yeah, instead I have more successes when I create the action myself. So that's a really important thing that you have to keep in mind. I hope that uh, this uh, uh, answer is uh, well enough to answer your question. So the next question comes from jump dash slash block, which asks me, you noted in your my own HEMA video that you're putting a lot of emphasis on footwork and mobility. What particular movements do you practice? Is it just drilling a cresser, decresser, passare, etc. Or you implemented other types of movements as well? Are there any big footwork, uh, footwork mistakes you see in beginners, intermediate fencers, etc.? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, generally speaking, the answer to the first question is kind of straightforward. So, under the concept of passare and tornare and uh, accresere, we have a huge variety of movements. So, if you think about it, if you put a lot of passare together, you can have, uh, if you put two passare together, you have uh, a trapassata, which you see in fighter um, fencing, sorry, in, let's say later fencing, sorry. If you do the aggressor in a different way, so instead of moving the front foot first and the uh, backward foot uh, uh, as the second one, uh, and instead you just do backward forward, um, you are more or less doing uh, again uh, an aggressor. So you are just doing the same movement, but uh, uh, you just invert the time at which uh, uh, every foot moves. So under this kind of big, uh, let's say, I don't know, ideas, I, of the, under these two big families of uh, uh, footwork, we can find a lot of different kind of footwork. So. Generally speaking, I don't try to limit myself on footwork because uh, sometimes you need speed. So uh, sometimes instead you need uh, very small movements. So if you do an accresor, which is always the same, you just have one tool. And if you do the passare, which is always the same, you have again only one tool. And uh, you put them together, you have two tools to move around. Instead, the fighting is dynamic. So yeah, you have these two tools, but you need uh, to create variation of these two tools because are the best, re the very basic one which you can use to move around. If you think about it, the aggressor, a very long aggressor, can be a lunge. I don't mean that you have to do very long uh, rapier or modern fencing kind of lunges, but you can't lunge with your forward foot and go backward if needed. 
you can do a passare, you can do two passare together, and you can do them uh, uh, unbalancing you forward just a bit to gain speed, or you can do them while keeping your balance. So, by using these uh, few movements, you can create a ton of movement patterns. And this is really important. You have to, um, let's say, create a huge variety of footworks to be free, basically, to, to be able to uh, deal with every kind of situation that you end up facing. So yeah, generally speaking, uh, I train these two kind of movements, which uh, end up being like 20, 30 kind of movements. I don't, uh, I don't even know. Um, just the last example, a very fast accessory, if you do it faster and then faster and then faster, and you want to do it longer, it becomes a jump and it works with the same pattern. So you move the forward foot first and then the, the backward one follows, but you do it really fast and then you, you end up jumping. So the jump forward follows the same pattern, pattern because the human body wants to do it and you want to do it, but it's a, a small jump. So that's the way in which the human body moves. So you don't have to fight against it. So this is the answer to the first question. The second question is, uh, um, of course, as you said, uh, you see big mistakes, etc., in intermediate fencer or beginners. I don't really consider myself a, a very high, a, a top level <laughs> HEMA fencer. I have seen a huge number of uh, uh, fencers which are like me or better than me. Uh, yeah, I have quite a lot of experience, but I don't think I, I, I can be able to judge this thing. The, the, the error which I see the most in beginners especially, but uh, it, it's, it's widespread. It's not something uh, uh, which is related to the pattern of movement. The, uh, the problem is related to the idea of footwork, in my opinion. So, the, if the idea is too strict, so you have a, a very, let's say, an, a, a not really wide way of looking at footwork, you end up being uh, chained to, as I said before, one or two kind of movement. And uh, uh, what happens when, uh, when these happen is that people tend to move around in a very bad way and, then, and they are not able to manage distance in a good way because they have just two tools to manage the distance. And uh, if, you, if you can only move by uh, 20 centimeters or, uh, I don't know, 90 centimeters uh, every movement you do, you have only two measures which you can deal with. Instead, you, will want, you, you should be able to move 1, 2, 10, 20 centimeters, whatever. So you have to train different uh, levels and uh, of the same step and different uh, uh, way of moving the body around. This is the biggest error that I see. I see people that are too focused on the idealized movement wrote on the manual. So when Fiore said uh, you can do a cresa di cresa e passare tornare, I am quite sure that uh, he wasn't meaning you have to move always with the same identical kind of movement every single time and you can't uh, do other kind of movement which are in line with that with that one uh, I, instead i suppose that he was most probably a really pragmatic person if we watch at the manual itself so i consider having a good footwork and a good variety of possibilities a very pragmatic thing when we are speaking about fighting then we can talk about relation to every different environment. So Fiore had to also fight in armor. And then you, have, you need a specific footwork which fits, you, you have to train something which fits all the environment you want to fight in. So this can vary uh, the, the way in which you train footwork. Uh, but this is another thing. So the, I will say that with footwork especially, you have to be very pragmatic. You consider what you're doing, train uh, well for what you're doing, and that's it. So I hope this answers your question. I know that uh, is a complex answer, but uh, yeah, that's what I think. 
So the last question is from uh, uh, Paolo Peronio, which asks me, don't you wear shoulder protectors? Personally, I never used them, but I was thinking that a blow to the rotator cuff can cause a very serious damage. So, um, to answer you, yes, uh, a strong blow can cause a very serious damage to your, your rotator cuff. That's true. Uh, the shoulder is, by the way, even if it's a very delicate kind of, uh, um, uh, of joint, because it's the most complex one, um, you can receive a slightly harder hit uh, without having serious damage, when we speak about sword fighting, compared instead to other joints. For example, the, the, the worst joint the one that you have to protect more is the elbow, because uh, of course you don't have a lot of flesh that protects it, while the shoulder instead can absorb uh, a little bit more punishment. So yeah, you can receive big damages on the shoulder, but uh, generally speaking in my 10 years and uh, talking about all the people that I have known, I've never seen someone in my, uh, in my experience, as I said, uh, which received an injury on the shoulder because uh, he received the blow. Instead, I know three persons that injured themselves while uh, waving the sword in an extreme way and uh, not being fit enough to do it, uh, they injured themselves on the shoulder. So funny enough, the shoulder is easier to, um, to hurt uh, by yourself. So it's more easy to hurt yourself on the shoulder than to receive a blow which hurts it. And that's mainly because, as I said before, physical training is important. You have to be well fit enough if you want, for example, to compete. Competing is, is uh, stressful and you, you go very fast, you strike uh, very strong blows sometimes. And uh, if you have to stop a blow uh, and you are not prepared physically or maybe you are have been just uh, unlucky, you just have changed your sword or your gloves and you start moving in a slightly different way, um, it may end up, uh, uh, you may end up receiving some kind of injury in your shoulder. Instead, uh, talking about uh, receiving blows, I received a good number of strong blows on my shoulders. Most of the times my uh, Axel Peterson jacket was uh, good enough to protect me because the protection on the shoulder is quite uh, strong. Uh, some other times I had, uh, uh, I felt the heat and I had a, a very huge bruise on my shoulder, but that's it. So I never received uh, a huge damage on the rotator cuff. So to answer your question, yes, we, uh, I, I suppose that uh, around the world and maybe in the future we will uh, uh, know uh, I will know that someone uh, has been get injured on the shoulder because of a blow. But uh, it's lesser important than other part, um, it's uh, lesser easy to damage with a blow compared to other joints, joints of, um, of our body. So yeah, I don't think uh, we, we strongly need a shoulder protector. Uh, and, uh, but this is also, um, I mean, if you feel the need of using it, you should buy it. That's my straightforward answer. Because uh, if, you need, uh, if you think that you need more protection on your shoulder because uh, just you feel it, do it. Don't, uh, don't ask for, for the opinion of someone. Uh, because it's, of course, uh, it, the safety is always the most important thing in our training. It comes first then if instead you don't feel the need yourself uh, and you never receive the blow which you make you think about it, well, just consider that maybe it's not worth the, the, the fact of adding something more on your protection because everything you add, you know, it makes your mobility uh, decrease. So that's, uh, that's the, the thing you have to take in consideration. If you, if you find some kind of protection which doesn't decrease <laughs> your mobility, which is kind of hard, and uh, protects you at the same time in a very good way, you can just add it without any problem. It's something really, really good to do anyway. 
So yeah, it's not a straightforward answer, uh, but uh, that's my opinion about the topic. It's not really easy to, to arch shoulders. I don't feel the, the need of a shoulder protector and I hope to not get injured also in the future and keep uh, uh, the same opinion in the future. So that said, people, I uh, hope you enjoyed this Q&A video. If you have some kind of question to answer me, as I said uh, uh, at the beginning of the video, just drop it in the comment section. I will answer them in the future video. So, as always, thanks for watching, people. Remember that if you want to help this channel and me in my video making uh, uh, work uh, process, you can uh, check my Patreon page. You will find it in the video description. Uh, there is a huge community that is growing now. Uh, we have a new Discord channel, which you can contact me directly uh, all day long, basically. Uh, I held one uh, voice chat uh, on Discord every week, in which uh, everyone can join, ask me things and chat with me, whatever. So I hope to see you there, and or better to hear you there. And uh, well, as always, thanks for watching and uh, well, see you next time.